Hi, this is Gary Meese. Back again with the case against. From the banks of beautiful Rotten Bayou. I'm going to do something a little different today, and I'm going to, instead of reading from my own book, I'm going to read from another book. And the book is Occult Crimes, Detection, Investigation, and Verification. The author is William Edward Lee Dubois, as opposed to W.A.B. Dubois, I suppose. Uh, the book was written in the early 90s, back when occult crime was a popular topic and, there, and uh, a lot of police officers were interested in that subject. And so uh, Dubois had a, a market for this book at the time. It's uh, cost me, my copy cost me $150, and uh, it's a pretty nice copy. Uh, you can probably find a used copy for somewhat less on the used book market, but it's not, you're not, it's not a book you're likely to find in just any used bookstore, and it's not going to be cheap unless you're very, very fortunate. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to read, I'm probably going to read through the whole book eventually. So I'm just going to start from the beginning, but I'm not going, I'm not going to devote every episode from now on to this book. Uh, I have a book that I'm covering right now concerning the West Memphis Three case, which is really my primary focus. And this is related to that case and that the investigators used this book in helping to determine that they their conclusion that there seemed to be some sort of ritualistic element with a strong possibility that it was a cult um, and they concluded that based on their investigation. Um, let me say the whole idea that, I, I'm going to say this again, I've said it in the past, the whole idea that um, the West Memphis Three case is part of the satanic panic phenomena is just ridiculous. It was tacked, it was tacked into that, that grouping of crimes much, much later as if it had bore some sort of significance uh, in those series of crimes, all, all of all almost all of which had to do with uh, allegations of ritual sexual child abuse, including some things with satanic or occult elements at, at daycare centers. Uh, needless to say, and no children were killed. Uh, most of those cases were dropped. Uh, I think I've talked about my own, own involvement in a, a series that's really part of the literature now in that I helped edit a series that's part of the literature now on, on that phenomenon that was published in the Commercial Appeal back in 1988. Uh, I had a lot of problems with it, with it as it went to press. I mean, I was basically told after the, I was handed what was deemed to be a finished product and asked to clean it up, mostly for the idea I was going to be fixing typos and... Uh, uh, spell it, misspellings and gr grammatical problems and so forth. I mean, I think that was the, the general intention. I had a lot of other problems with it, and they cleared up some of those problems before they went to press, and some of them they didn't. A lot of it had to do with anomalies and what the, the, the uh, facts that were actually presented were, you know, cases where people were actually convicted of, <laughs> you know, child abuse for instance, and are cases that would, you know, really there was no element of ritualism involved. However, unfortunately, it does go on, uh, child abuse, sexual child abuse does go on at daycare centers. Uh, hopefully it very, very infrequently, but it, you know, there, there are going to be some instances of that. And, uh, 
what seems to have happened is there may have been, uh, there's a book called The Witch Hunt Narrative that's very, very interesting. It delves deeply, deeply into those cases. And Ross Cheat, I think is his, how, how his name spelled, and he, he, he sp spent years and years uh, researching that book and delves very deeply into those cases. And what he finds is, yeah, there were a lot, some allegations that were blown up, that were almost virtually made up, some really bad uh, h handling of the children by investigators and, and experts that were brought in. But there were also many instances where there was actual child abuse involved. And the unfortunate thing is that somehow got lost in the backlash to the whole satanic ritual abuse craze. Now, and, and I would argue that very, in a very similar fashion, because West Memphis Three has been thrown into that mix, they have, it has nothing to do with any of those other cases. It's not even similar in any sense except children were involved and there was sexual abuse involved, almost certainly. Uh, physical evidence suggests that. Um, what's also happened with the West Memphis Three case is it, it because of ritual, the whole rituals, child abuse thing, the satanic panic, so to speak, has basically been gotten to the point where it's treated like a joke, uh, like a bad joke, uh, really very poor handling of uh, of their powers by the police and prosecutors and the courts. Uh, the West Memphis Three has been thrown into that mix to discredit the way the case was handled. The case was handled appropriately, not perfectly. I can tell you, I'd be happy to go over, I've gone over things that they didn't do right. And honestly, their track record holds up pretty well compared to Almost, I haven't studied every criminal case that ever existed, but you know, the bigger cases that, that came along, there was mishandling of those cases, you know, problems with those cases, uh, the, the, the investigations and sloppier investigations than, than anything that happened in the West Memphis Three case, which was actually handled pretty well considering the daunting circumstances and the whole shocking nature of the crime for a small town, not even a really small town, but a medium-sized town uh, police department. And they were, it was not a quiet, it's not a Mayberry place. They have a lot of crime in West Memphis. It's a rough city in many respects and has been from its almost from its founding, uh, but uh, so they were used to handling criminals, but they weren't hand, used to handling that kind of crime. No one is used to that kind of crime. Now, it, um, this is a long introduction to this, and I may not read that much of the of the actual book, but. Uh, what happened with the, the arrest were based on the confession of some, and there were uh, there was other ev uh, other very good evidence, uh, but the arrest really hinged on the confession of Jesse Miskelly Jr., which was not coerced, not forced, uh, and was pretty consistent with the way the, the crime scene looked. He had special knowledge of, of the crimes describing how the boys were killed and details that just weren't available to the public and it would only have been known to someone who was there or someone who was actively investigating the case. And he was not somebody who was in that loop by any stretch of the imagination. He, he described the crimes and then he described being involved in s satanic rites with Jason Baldwin and uh, Damian Eccles, who were the two guys he killed the children with. Now the confession doesn't really tie, 
confession does not really tie explicitly and concretely the satanic rites with the killing of the children. Though it is clear that Damien, Jason, and Jesse were going to West Memphis for, on that particular day for some particular purpose. Uh, May 5th is, according to some witchy Wicca type calendars, is, is, is that the actual date of Beltane, which is one of the f four high or low, if you want to put it. It's one of the holy days, one of the sacred days for the people who are practicing witchcraft, certain forms of it anyway, most popular forms. So uh, the date could have some significance. It was a full moon. As we go along here, we'll see that there were elements of the setting that were very important in terms of if it was going to be uh, a, a, an occult crime. You know, here it is. It's sunset, moonrise. The, the full moon rising, the sun setting occurred within just a few minutes of each other about the time the killings w were occurring. Um, it's, uh, you know, there were, there were, the boys were tied and what looked, it's, for no practical purpose, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't have been bound, uh, kept from running are uh, undoing the ties that they'd been conscious. So what was the purpose of the way they were tied? It's very strange and it looks ritualistic. Uh, bindings are part of ritualistic rites. They're parts of rites of other organizations. It's not that unusual. And it's understood that that is uh, one of the ways that people mark uh, the mark the initiate or uh, the, the person of spe special interest off from everybody else is that they're bound and their will has been taken from them, so to speak, even if it's done in some sort of symbolic, it, it, well, of course it's done in symbolic fashion, but even if it's done in what is clearly just symbolic fashion, and they could easily walk away from the scene if they wanted to. Okay. So, part of what I'm getting at is, is Damien Eccles, there's very little he does that doesn't have some occult purpose behind it. Um, it not, nothing he's done since uh, he's gotten out of prison has had anything to do with other than you know hanging out with celebrities he liked the fame mostly he's he's about two things money and making money any way he can any way he can grub any way he can fleece and I guess they get people get probably get what they're probably happy with the product that he's selling to the people he's selling his crap to are probably happy with it they seem to be happy with it and, you know, they have a perfect right to buy crap, but, you know, it's still a bunch of stupid crap that he sells. It's not particularly well done. He's not particularly smart about it, or, or he's not, not the least bit original. Uh, anybody could, with a little bit of study could do what he's doing, but most people won't make, put themselves out to look that silly doing it. I certainly wouldn't. A little too much self-respect for that, but you know, Damien, perhaps I think he probably actually believes in this stuff on some level. Uh, I think he's a true believer in that sense. Um, he, uh, so and everything he does is for a ritualistic purpose. When he was asked who, who was responsible for this, he said Satanist. He also said it was a thrill kill, and he mentioned revenge as a, po as a possible motive. 
I don't know how revenge would have necessarily played into this. I could speculate about that, but I'm not going to because it's pointless and there's really no evidence of of uh, a re revenge being a valid motive. But Damien was, a, he is, is and was a liar and, you know, he's perfectly willing to make stuff up. <coughs> but even liars tell the truth sometime. <coughs> Coughing now. Coughing already started. Not good. Um, even liars uh, tell the truth sometimes. And, you know, Damien likes to give you the truth, but coat it with, with his own special blend of bullshit. which is part of what got him in trouble. Instead of being, playing it straight with investigators, he wanted to play games, which is a really a silly or serial killer type move. I'm not saying he is one, but that's, you know, that's what these psychopathic killers like to do is they like to play games with the investigators and they end up getting themselves in big trouble with for that. Uh, and I'm going to mention briefly two other things that tie into this uh, concerning ritual sacrifice of children. There's a report from Deanna Holcomb, his former girlfriend, who said that she and Damien both practiced black magic. And she stated that Damien's intention when they were going together was... If they ever had a child, they would sacrifice it, and she would be the one to sacrifice it. And she said that was the reason they broke up. I'm not sure that's actually the case. They were forcibly pulled apart and sent off to separate mental facilities when they were caught running away from each other. And that basically started Damien's he wasn't in good shape before, but he had a year where he was in a downward spiral of trips to mental institutions and very, you know, getting into all sorts of different kinds of trouble. Um, and uh, and he had a lot of family problems going on that whole year, incredible amount of family problems going on that year that we know about and a whole bunch of stuff I'm sure we don't know about and never would. But anyway... Um, she said that she drew the line at that, and that's when she broke up with Damien. Now, as I say, that's not really why they broke up. They were forced apart. In fact, they were forced apart. Uh, her parents did not like Damien for really obvious reasons. And basically, she got so much pressure that, you know, the relationship fell apart. They were kids in high school at the time. Uh, the other thing, Damien had fed Jerry Driver this story about a group that was in a Crittenden County that were, had been sacrificing animals, and they were sort of working their way up to humans. Now, whether Damien Eccles was just feeding Jerry Driver a line to keep him busy, to entertain himself, and to, to see how, what driver would, how the driver would react to this news. I don't know. I mean, maybe he actually knew people like that. There's pro again, there's, prob there's probably an element of truth in that, of truth in that. And the truth is, is it sounds like what he and Jason were doing, but he wants to code it with this sto story about this other group sacrificing animals and planning on killing people. Jason and Damien also had talked about uh, killing bums under underpasses, which they have a fair amount of in West Memphis, uh, mist which is why the Mr. Bojangles incident is not that unusual. It's, it, it's a place where uh, truckers stop. There's a lot of transients there. Uh, there are a lot of bums there, a lot of and a lot of people, tramps and homeless. We see mentions of that in the investigative files, and I can speak from personal experience that I've I saw plenty of that when I was in West Memphis. So, but they they were talking about 
killing uh, Jason and Damien were thought were talking about killing bums, but not not obviously for ritualistic purposes. It sounded like more it was just let's kill kill, let's have a thrill kill. So that was a real thing there, the the thrill kill aspect. I and I think there were mixed motives with this and quite possibly uh, from Damien's standpoint, you know, the a fortuitous set of circumstances put these boys in in uh, this place at this time that he could uh, use them in this horrible way for his own purposes. And in his own mind, he almost certainly turned it around so that it was a source of gaining power for him whether he was explicitly planning to go kill three little children that day or not it fits in perfectly with his psychology uh, so I, my part of what I'm saying is is we don't and there there are cult, there are some things w involved in the case that seem to have could seem to have some sort of occult or ritualistic aspect to them we know that we know that at least one of the boys was very one of the killers was very much into the occult and his best friend was certainly aware of the occult from hanging around with this uh, psychopathic killer since he's a psychopathic killer too they're two of a kind uh, and the third boy was aware of what they were doing <coughs> as far as animal sacrifices and so forth. And he didn't, he didn't uh, balk at hanging around with them. And I'm, I'm going to read just about everything in here, including the warning on the front, the front, the inside the cover here. It says, because of its privileged subject matter, this book is intended for the law enforcement community only. Its sole purpose is to help law enforcement officers detect, investigate, and verify occult crimes. And every effort should be made to protect it and the information contained in it. General knowledge of this information can negatively affect officer safety and investigative effectiveness. This book is intended to serve both as a training manual and as a field handbook and covers virtually every specialized aspect of occult crime. It is not available to and in no way intended for the general public. And um, let me just say, you know, whether you want to view this book as uh, an his interesting historical artifact or maybe a valuable source of information to understand the think the what was going on with the thinking of police and with the perpetrators and uh, are the investigators and such crimes as there well there have been two on Netflix recently, the Sons of Sam, where you see Mari Terry go down the rabbit hole of this cut, uh, uncovering what he sees as an occult crime. Uh, a very interesting miniseries. Netflix occasionally has some really good stuff. Uh, another very interesting case, very well known case, is the the Night Stalker case with a, an avowed Satanist with close ties with the Church of Satan in San Francisco. Uh, and that's that case is also covered in a Netflix series. So it's this information is still relevant and uh, uh, even if you just want to view it from a historical standpoint certainly some of it's going to be dated the, the book is 30 years old uh, there's a note here about occult crime seminars the American Police Academy in Washington DC issues training certificates for all occult crime cases taught by the author author and continuing education credits are available through Columbia Pacific University. Another, I think our, our good old friend, uh, 
You know, I, I wasn't aware of this, but I think that is the same place where uh, Dale Griffiths got his Ph.D., uh, but they are continuing education credits, uh, and this guy what, uh, did teach classes at something that sounds pretty official, the American Police Academy in Washington, D.C., and he was, they were issuing certificates for occult crime classes. And he, he is very knowledgeable about occult crimes, and he takes a very balanced view, I feel. I, and I, I haven't read through this whole book recently, so I, 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 I can't speak on everything I would disagree with him about, but you know, there are parts of it that I'm just not going to go along with. I think he may be overreaching here and there, or maybe, maybe a lot more than here and there, but uh, we'll sort of leave it at that. Here's an interesting acknowledgement, and this, this, he couldn't possibly be talking about our Jesse, our Jesse Miskelly. But in the acknowledgements, he says, and I don't think he is, he's even got Jesse in quotes, so it's probably not even Jesse, this Jesse's real name. It says, and to Jesse, liar, drug addict, psychopath, or perhaps but probably not the innocent victim of an occult group who, with an in no intention of doing so, taught me to think very carefully about all occult ca cases before jumping to conclusions. <coughs> and here's a note from the author. About this book, at least 25% of the officers attending my seminars tell me they have seen occult crimes in the past but at that time did not know what they were looking at. That part was in italics because they had never had any occult crime training. Training is the key to understanding the size and scope of our nation's occult crime problem and training is one of the purposes of this book. This book is more than a training manual, however. It is also a handbook to assist officers in every specialized phase of an occult crime investigation in the field. It is a designed to teach officers about both criminal and non-criminal satanic groups, and it contains a wealth of supporting reference data. This, and the, the, it needs back to italics here. This is not an armchair book, and it is not a book of theories. It is a book of facts and a book of field-proven procedures. It is written from personal end of italics. It is written from personal experience, personal successes, and personal failures. I've worked with law enforcement agencies from coast to coast. I've been at crime scenes. I've worked surveillance. I've sifted, sifted through hundreds of pages of case files. I've listened to hours and hours of taped interviews. I've interrogated Satanists and interviewed victims. I spent days in many libraries trying to track down occult symbols. Occult crime is growing, and officers need to be ready to deal with these crimes when they encounter them. And then this is uh, an inset set off uh, in italic type. Again, several things here, uh, the way that it's, it's uh, placed in the book, the design of the page, uh, the typography, I'll indicate that, that this has special emphasis, so pay attention. The key to resolving any occult case is a mode of thinking, a way of mentally approaching such cases. The primary purpose of this book is to teach officers this way of thinking about cases and so provide the backup in the form of reference data, illustrations, and criminal profiles that officers need to help solve occult crimes. The end of that. And he adds this, in, about Satanist. Although various types of Satanist are responsible for the vast bulk of American occult crime, it is important for officers to remember that Satanism is a religion. Satanists are shielded by the first, same First Amendment protections that give all of us the right to be Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Buddhist, Islamic, Pagan, or New Age. Satanists are protected until they break the law. 
So, you know, he's giving himself some cover there. Uh, he, he makes a very valid legal point. He also says that various types of Satanists are responsible for the vast bulk of American occult crime. Now, I see Satanists in, saying, oh, they're, you know, really law-abiding, good people. You know, not a problem. Everybody should love love their any Satanist that they know. And then he has the first, he quotes the next page, has the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I don't know if I really need to read that, but it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, then, Occult Crime and Occult Criminology, this chapter. And he's going to do some definitions here. Occult. The literal meaning of occult is a secret, is secret or hidden. But in modern America, the term refers to a large religious movement that encompasses a wide variety of magical and supernatural teachings. Occult crime. Any criminal activity that is part of a religious practice is inspired by a person's religious beliefs or is committed under the color of religion. I I really don't agree with that definition. I think it's far too broad, but that is his definition that he's working with. <coughs> and he's still saying that Satanists commit most of the occult crimes, so he gets into other examples very shortly, but even so, he's he's not letting he's not just adding in every crime committed under the guise of religion uh, in the country for for no reason whatsoever. He's he's trying to be even-handed about this, I think. And then a cult criminology definition, the study of crime associated with religious groups and the development of strategies to deal with these crimes. Okay, that's the end of the definitions. Getting into the meat of the book here. A crime is classified as an occult crime, not because of the type of crime it is, but because of the motive of the perpetrator. There are hundreds of different types of occult crimes ranging from homicide to vandalism. And there is no one type of occult crime that is more common than the others. I'm sure that's not true. Occult vandalism is much more frequent than uh, occult murders, which are very rare. I, I, I would argue they're very, very rare. They do occur very rare. Uh, kids putting up signs of the pentagram which arguably isn't even a cult, a cult crime, but let's just say it is. Uh, vandalism is a crime, and it is it is a cult in nature. I just don't. I'm not sure their motive is really that a cult. They're just vandalizing to. They're trying to scandalize people. But um, let's let's just call that an occult crime. That's very common. I think we all know that. Although most occult crimes are associated with non-mainstream religions, in the broadest sense, an occult crime can be committed by any person of any religion. A Christian televangelist who defrauds his flock for profit has committed an occult crime. So, according to him, Jim, Jim and Tammy Baker committed occult crimes. Not sure I buy that. They were, They did commit crimes. So has a so has a Catholic priest who uses his position to molest choir boys. And again, that's <laughs> far too frequent to uh, make light of, and I'm not sure that's an occult crime either. It's a horrible crime. It's just not an occult crime. More than 900 members of the People's Temple, including 280 children, were victims of an occult crime when the Reverend Jim Jones 
ordered them to commit mass suicide and they obeyed. Uh, 15 people were sacrificed in Matamoros, Texas, by Mexico on the Texas border to appease the gods of drug running. <coughs> and there, there were specifically occult um, intentions in those crimes. Um, and the leader of a Mormon splinter group in Kirkland, Ohio, killed a family of five who tried to leave his group. All of these are occult crimes and all fall under the jurisdiction of the occult criminologist. Occult criminology is the newest of the police sciences and it takes a nuts and bolts approach to the subject. Occult criminology seeks useful solutions to problems, not just a broad understanding of cultural phenomena. Occult criminology should not be confused with parapsychology because while occult criminology deals with people's belief in supernatural powers, it does not study these powers or seek to validate their existence. The only interest the occult criminologist takes in the supernatural is how such beliefs affect, affect subject behavior. And then he adds this note. This book takes a narrow focus on occult criminology dealing primarily with criminal satanic groups. Satanic groups are probably the largest concern to American law enforcement because the bulk of occult crimes in the United States are committed in the name of Satan. He says this again, so, you know, some of these other, other sorts of crimes, uh, you know, I really hate saying this, but I suspect that the uh, instances of child abuse by priest is more common than crimes committed by Satanists. And I, I'm not saying that as a critic of the church uh, or to run down, certainly not to run down religion. I, I, I think it's fair to criticize the church for the way it's handled all that. Uh, so in that sense, I'm being a critic, but uh, the fact is, is there's lots and lots of children, lots and lots, lots of priests. And so, unfortunately, even if it was somewhat uncommon, it's questionable about that, it's still, um, It's still more prevalent, I think, than Satanists, which are really just a fringe, a, a fringe element in American society. I've never met a, 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 a professing Satanist. I've lived a long time. Admittedly, I've lived in, you know, some backward areas. In fact, I seem to have specialized in living in backward areas, which is fine with me. I like backward areas. Uh, they're usually ahead of the curve. We, nobody, else, nobody else is caught up with them in terms of what's actually going on in the world. But uh, the, you know, and I've met, I've met people who said they practice witchcraft. Not a lot, but some. Uh, I, there was even a uh, person I, I didn't know at all who was invited to stay at our home overnight. It was a friend of a friend. They were traveling and the next, the next day they left and you know, it was mentioned to me, oh yeah, the so-and-so is, she's a, a, a witch, she practices Wicca. And I thought, well, we didn't really discuss that. In fact, I didn't say it, I barely saw them. I didn't say much of anything to them at all. But I actually had a Wiccan living in my, staying at my house for one night. Uh -oh. I'm gonna read a little bit more Criminal activity associated with occult groups. Occult crime is broken into three categories, ritualistic crime, occult-inspired crime, and occult economic crime. 
defines these terms. Ritualistic crime, he abbreviates it RC, criminal activity that is part of a religious practice. Occult-inspired crime, OIC, criminal activity inspired by the individual's religion or religious belief. Occult economic crime, OEC, crime committed for the purpose of financially supporting the religious activity or crime committed for economic gain that is committed under the color of religion. Okay. I'm not really getting that last category, but except the broad, the broad terms that he defines uh, religious crime. Uh, occult crime. Uh, no type of occult worship is illegal in itself, and all types of occult worship are protected by citizens' rights to freedom of religion guaranteed by the First Amendment. And now we get into the italics. Any crimes committed by a group's members, however, are another matter altogether. End of italics. The vast bulk of a t detectable occult crime in America is committed by juveniles involved in satanic worship. Like our friends uh, Jason Baldwin, Jesse Miskelly Jr., and Damian Eccles. This does not imply the crimes are not serious. In pursuit of satanic worship, juveniles in this country have committed the crimes of homicide. Certainly that happens in the what happened in the West Memphis Three case. Uh, rape. Uh, there was sexual molestation going on. Kidnapping, assault, they assault, there was assault prior to the killings, and arson. And Damien set fires to his school that we know about. He also bragged he burned his father's garage down and, and stood in the flames chanting. Additionally, animal abuse, Damien Eccles was involved in that. Uh, actually, all three of them were involved on, on some level, according to Jesse Miskelly Jr. Uh, graveyard desecration, vandalism, theft, and trespassing are all a common part of juvenile satanic worship. Occult crime associated with any occult group can be broken into three very different and distinct types. Ritualistic crime, occult-inspired crime, and occult economic crime. And he goes, he, this is going to repeat somewhat, but it doesn't hurt to repeat things so that we remember them. Relig ritualistic crime is a criminal activity that is part of the religious practice. As such, these crimes are always premeditated. Ritualistic cr crimes are classified as follows. He's got the he's got all these these levels four different levels level one uh, homicides level two non-fatal crimes against persons level three crimes not against persons that are felonies and crimes that are not against persons that are misdemeanors an example is a 16 year old abducts his infant niece and kills her with a boot knife during a full moon ritual as a sacrifice to Satan Uh, has some resonance with the West Memphis Three case. This is an example of re ritualistic crime, RC level one in this case. Occult inspired crime is criminal activity inspired by the individual's religion or religious belief. Uh, occult inspired crime is generally not premeditated and is often difficult to recognize as an occult crime. Occult crimes are classified as follows, and he's got four that are <coughs> essentially the same <coughs> four categories that he had for the ritualistic crimes. Uh, homicides, non-fatal crimes, crimes not against persons that are felonies, and crimes not against persons that are misdemeanors. Uh, uh, crimes not against persons that are misdemeanors would be perhaps vandalism, the van, 
there is such a thing as felony vandalism so it probably just depends or trespassing and you know again uh, those are crimes that might go either way depending on the jurisdiction example a 36 year old rapes and severely beats a prostitute in a in an alley because he believes Satan would appreciate his actions. This is an example of a cult inspired crime, OIC level two in this case. And I think I think it's not clear for us whether we're talking with in terms of West Memphis three if if it was a cult inspired or ritualistic uh, based on the description of uh, Jesse Miskelly Jr. It sounded like a thrill killing. A bunch of drunken kids bully some other kids and bullying, get carried away with the bullying <coughs> and end up killing the kids. Uh, but a thrill kill. And Jesse actually doesn't seem to have been too thrilled by the whole experience. I think he was traumatized by it. Uh, I don't feel sorry for him. He did it to himself and he participated in it, but uh, I think he was traumatized by what he did after the fact. But it, it sounded more, it sounds more like an occult inspired crime but you know there are some elements that make you think that there might have had a specific relig ritualistic purpose. I've already mentioned most of those. And then we're going to get into a cult economic crime. Which to me is not very interesting, but I'll read this. Is it criminal activity committed with the sole purpose of financially supporting the religious activity or is crime committed for economic gain under the color of religion? It is also used as a subcategory of the other two categories when the primary motivation of the crime is of the other two categories. But the crime also benefits the perpetrators economically. Such crimes may include pornography, drug sales, robberies and burglaries, and fraud. Uh, occult economic crime are classified as follows, and he has the same four levels <coughs> of crime there and his example is a 14 year old extorts lunch money from a group of middle school students by threatening to hex them if they don't pray, pay each week <coughs> this is, ex is an example of occult economic crime which would be he says that's level 2 non-fatal crimes against persons uh Okay, uh, and that's all I'm going to read. I'm coughing, a I'm beginning to cough a little too much, which is a problem. I've got some alkaline water here. I'm trying to cover up my coughs, but it's still very, it's very aggravating to the point that, you know, I've almost swore off. I've come very close to swearing off podcasting forever because of that particular problem. And I don't go around coughing all the time. If I talk for a long period of time, my throat gets irritated and I cough. I'm not in bad health, uh, not dying. Some of you may wish I was, but I'm not. Or if I am, I don't know it, and neither does my doctor. Um, the next chapter has that I'm not going to read today because I'm going to wrap it up, but it has an interesting title called Magical Theory and Practice. Where have we heard that term before? You know, it's a shame Aleister Crowley didn't write a book called Magical Theory and Practice. Oh yeah, but he did. And uh, good thing for Damien Eccles because he, he can crib off uh, the work of others for years and years to come. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, I hope this wasn't too much of a departure from what I'm usually talking about. I think it's relevant. 
uh, I think it's interesting. And, you know, you may not agree, but some people might be interested in this who wouldn't be interested in the West Memphis 3 case. I have three books for sale on Amazon concerning the West Memphis 3 case, a two-volume set that really covers the whole case in a roughly chronological order uh, called B First Volumes Blood on Black. The second is Where the Monsters Go. I combined those two, or rev revised them, shrunk it down, edited it very heavily into, uh, b the, basically I took those two books and cut them down to half what they were, uh, left out things that were not strictly relevant, but if you really want to know about the case, you probably should know. Um, if you really want to learn a lot about the case, you're, go you got, you're going to see references to it and you won't know what they're talking about because it's not totally relevant to the case. It's relevant, but it's not vital to the case. And there are lots of th there's lots of information about the West Memphis Three case that not in my book. And uh, my books, uh, but you know, to do a book with everything that's known about it would require replicating all the case files, et cetera, et cetera. So we're talking, how, I don't know how many thousands of pages that would be. So that's not practical. Anyway, um, I'm signing off for now. I wish you all well. I personally am enjoying a COVID. <coughs> My personal world is COVID free right now. I hope yours is too, and I hope it stays that way. But, you know, um, when I say COVID free, I'm not seeing any discernible effects other than a few places I go, people are just now sort of coming out of the woodwork, getting out and doing things, and I haven't seen them for a while. Other than that, things are sort of back to normal, and I think it feels great. Anyway, that's all. Bye-bye.